and uh, Tony embarrasses me a little because he does such a good job. The tie, yeah, tradition, respect, whatever. That doesn't bother me. <laughs> but I thought I'd talk about mysteries. Uh, I was going to talk about a lot more, but it actually, there's, there's a lot on it. And I want to start in Acts 17, which doesn't necessarily talk about mysteries, starting at verse 16. <clears throat> Acts 17, 16, talking about a guy that one of the classes this morning talked about who says things sometimes difficult to understand. But this one is not so difficult to understand. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was steered in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Holy, I mean, and yet he was there. Interesting. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with devout persons, more than Jews in other words, and in the market daily. Uh, this is something that maybe a lot of people have trouble with. I have trouble with it. Disputing daily. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, you take up a club and it turns into a shouting match. I don't believe that's the case at all. Discussing for Jesus Christ, the argument for him, for God. And he, he wasn't being a nuisance on a street corner. He was discussing only with those who were interested, those who met with him end of that verse. Verse 18, then certain philosophers, oh my, philosophers, <laughs> we know about them, don't we? In fact, you can get to find a philosopher to say anything, interestingly enough, of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? <laughs> they weren't too impressed with him, were they? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So that's a strange God, the resurrection. Okay. <clears throat> but from their point of view. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. So there's where the mystery comes in. It was a new doctrine to them. And they're actually don't have a bad attitude. They wanted to understand. At least they weren't giving him cancel culture, or worse, were they? They were, they were, okay, let's check this out. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Explain this to us. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Wow. Wow, they spent all their time? Didn't they have jobs and work? Well, probably more of an agrarian society, even in the city, wasn't it? I guess they didn't need cars, computers, cell phones, video games, 3,000 square foot homes with air conditioning and heat pumps and extra cars and extra computers. You might not have to work 60 hours a week if you don't need all that stuff. Of course, they, they probably didn't have the jobs available, so they did with less, didn't they? And they used the time to semi-educate themselves. At least they were looking into things. Verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Okay, I'll explain it to you. There's one you don't know about, but you are accidentally given reverence to him anyway. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not 
in temples made with hands. He's not here. He's not in these things that you built. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. I can remember early in the church here that, you know, I was probably late. In fact, I know I was late. This occurring to me, God doesn't need anything I have. <laughs> I haven't got any. He gave it all to me. Uh, wow. I am in need of him and his blessings, and he doesn't even need my money. But I need his blessings, so I better check out what he expects me to do. And verse 26 is interesting also. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. So is God a racist? No. One blood. Not a problem at all. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. What? what, what? The bounds of their habit habitation? Wait, aren't we going to Mars? Maybe not. Even the purveyors, those who are promoting, let's, let's prepare, let's go to Mars, are well aware that if they can't change the environment on Mars radically, it's not going to work. Life there would have to be supported from here with a constant supply of spaceships to take everything needed. There's nothing to support life there. And in, the, in their weird plans, they have various plans about how to have nuclear fire at the poles or have a nuclear moon that they'll establish going around just constantly on fire. Okay, they got to heat it up. They know that. But doesn't that have a whole host of other problems? Oh, never mind. <laughs> anyway, what's the chances of that happening? Yeah, just, just a thought question for you. So the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. Why? Because of the bounds of their habitation. If you want something more, it's only going to come from God. Mars is not going to be our solution or anything like that. But there is a solution. If happily they might feel after him and find him. He's findable though he be not far from every one of us. Yeah, we're made in his image. We live, we breathe, we eat because of him. He gave us freedom of choice, so we don't have to give him credit. We don't have to think about him. But nonetheless, that's, that's what we've got going on right now. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. Are we part of God? You know, not in the sense that uh, some spiritualists would like to think, but we are, in a, another sense, certainly a part of him. He created us. That's what we got going. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Even the philosophers and the people of the world know there's something going on here. You know, with all the unbelievable billions of dollars they've spent, both secretly and openly, to try to create life. To, for what purpose? Well, to make war better or to prove that God doesn't exist for multiple reasons. But uh, they're aware that that doesn't work. So there's basic acknowledgement that we are created of God. Uh, but without looking into it, we might not know which God. Well, the scriptures have one description that I love, the living God. That's the one. Verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Now this word Godhead, a lot of people misuse that. So I'd like to read this from another version, ESV. And in fact, I've got, I can't remember right now, 26 or 27 versions, and most of them are like this one I'm about to read and not like the King James, which says, being then God's offspring, 
we ought not to think that the divine being is like God or silver, excuse, excuse me, is like gold, wow, every letter matters, right? <laughs> is like gold or silver or a stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So God's being is not something we can exactly imagine, and we certainly aren't going to make pictures of it. We have a rough idea. There's so many verses that talk that talk about his form and that he does exist. But we aren't going to make a picture of it. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> Verse 30. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. My comment on this is, that was then. God winked at that. This is now. We can't worry about that. We worry about now. God sent his son to settle all accounts. Now we need to pay attention. Looking at the different dispensations, a lot of people try to insult other people by saying, oh, you're a dispensationalist. I haven't yet figured out why that's an insult, because obviously there's dispensations. God changes the law, gives a different dispensation. He eliminates one society with the flood, going to eliminate another one with the fire. Hasn't happened yet. So we need to pay attention because we're at a different one now, kind of the final one. God sent his son. That's different. Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day, a day, that's an important day, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, his son, that man, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. This is something different. I mean, other people were raised from the dead, but not to eternal life, never to die again. Jesus is the only one. Finish this passage with 32 here. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. We would expect that, right? And others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Some of them were going, hmm. And others were laughing. You know, you look on the internet these days, and I would say that most laugh now. There's a few that go, hmm, okay, maybe, all right. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 1. Talk about different things here. Again, we aren't going to have the word mystery here, but something that's kind of mysterious or strange. 1 Corinthians 1, starting at verse 18. Sorry, I didn't say that. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. In other words, those who don't accept it, that's silly. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Yeah. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That's kind of what Paul was dealing with, wasn't he? Some were laughing and some were considering it. And uh, God is talking about using this method. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Well, the world doesn't think so. But if, perchance, God is right, then yes. They will never admit it, but the fact that they can't create their own life it makes it kind of silly because they believe they can. They think they've got it figured out, but yet it doesn't work. Numerous times in my lifetime, they've thought they had it. Oh, yeah, we got it this time, even clear back in the 70s. It was always a chemical reaction. They think they understand which chemicals create life, and they get them all together and put them in a Petri dish and put electricity and heat and whatever they think will create life in it. And they keep thinking they get it, but you know what? It just doesn't work. 
I think that there's so many layers to this stuff that have been being discovered in the past 100, 200 years that the smartest scientists, probably we don't hear much from the smartest scientists. I think we hear from the political scientists, not the smartest ones. They figure out, oh, wait, that skin isn't just skin. There's a bunch of cells there. And then they figure out that each cell is made up of a whole bunch of things. And then they find out that all those things are made up of a whole bunch of things, and so on and so forth until you're down to the atomic level, which is really beyond our comprehension. We think we know some things about it. But I expect that that's not the bottom level, which is why men aren't figuring it out. It's a mystery to us. We do not understand that yet. And I think that's provable. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Well, not according to the world, but their argument doesn't hold much water. Verse 21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Yeah, I'm smart. I got this figured out. I don't need God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Yeah, that's the world is just laughing at us, aren't they? To save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Which are we? Oh, we're Greeks. I admit, I love wisdom and truth. Could it be a hang-up? Well, of course it could be a hang-up. But go a little farther and deeper into it, and that hang-up will explain that there has to be a God. There is a God. He's got everything in control. So... The wisdom that I can get will never compare to what God has. Let's turn to Matthew 13, start at verse 11. Matthew 13, 11. Which says, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. He's talking in parables here to the Jews. And the apostles are asking, well, wh wh why are you always doing that? And so he explains to them, it's, it's, it is mysteries to them, but it's given to you to know those mysteries. Verse 12, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. This almost sounds unfair, doesn't it? But remember that those Jews were looking for a reason to reject Jesus. They were not being even as wise as the Stoics and the Epicureans who said, hey, explain this to us. They were actually openly rejecting. They didn't want the explanation. <clears throat> but the apostles, that was different, wasn't it? When Jesus walked up and said, follow me, have you ever thought about that? I mean, I know you have. Why did they get up and follow him? Would they have followed anybody? No. Remember that about the time that Jesus was born, all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Why? Because they knew the time was there for the Messiah to be born. They knew that. The information was available. Now, the apostles knew of that also, and they were watching things. They were watching Jesus, and when he said, let's go, we got work to do, they believed the information. They recognized at some level who he was and what was going on. They weren't questioning and rejecting. They were saying, oh, okay, yeah, this is the time. This may be the guy. Let's check it out. <clears throat> they did not follow ignorantly. They accepted the evidence and the information at a good enough level to, 
to work. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them, the Jews, in parables, because they, seeing, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. So we see that it was even prophesied that they didn't want to see, they didn't want to understand. So of course the majority of them rejected. This was common knowledge. The fact that the majority of them rejected thankfully didn't dissuade the apostles and other disciples from saying, yeah, okay, let's go. So you don't have to go along with the crowd. Understanding is available. But if you don't want to understand, then it's all a parable to you. Verse 15, for this people's heart is waxed gross, and their eyes are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Let's not do that. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and it should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. So is this saying that they could see and hear and understand anytime they wanted to? Yeah, that's exactly what this is saying. They could. And some did, but not the nation as a whole. Why? Because they didn't want to understand the mystery of God. They wanted something different. They wanted to remain the head nation or become again the head nation. Their desired understanding of the prophets in the Old Testament was certainly accurate to a point, but it wasn't complete. Israel will again be the head nation. The king will come and settle the, that issue. That's what they wanted. They didn't want to go through the rest of it. Maybe they didn't understand it. Why don't you understand it? Because they didn't want to. That meant they'd have to change. It appears to me that change is something that the human psyche resists at all costs. Obviously some exceptions, but in general, how do you like it when you have to change? What does that say? That says you were wrong before you changed. And you know what? That doesn't slide down very easily. I don't want to have to admit I was wrong, ever. Am I the only one? Yeah, I know you don't have to answer that. <laughs> I don't think so. <clears throat> yeah. They wanted to continue in their minds to be as gods among the people, above the Gentiles, even though they weren't doing their job in being Jehovah's Witnesses. They weren't sharing God. They were instead setting themselves apart. They were handling it wrong. How do we feel about America? Do we hold our country in great esteem? Hmm. Is it going to survive? <clears throat> Just a thought question. Let's turn to Romans 11, verse 25. Romans 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. You can figure it out. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So there is a time frame here. The fullness of the Gentiles wasn't yet there. In fact, it was just really starting out, wasn't it? But that was something they were not supposed to be ignorant of. But they were. Paul was talking to his own people there. Let's turn to the 16th chapter of Romans and read verse 25. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel 
and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Huh, the mystery was kept secret. Verse 26, but now is made manifest. It's become apparent. Jesus came, made it manifest. Continuing on, and by the scriptures of the prophets, so it was available even from the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. They didn't understand all the prophecies of the Messiah. They didn't understand the preaching part, the repentance part, the death, burial, and resurrection part. But now when Paul is writing this, they understood. It had become clear. Not a mystery anymore. Not that they accepted it, lock, stock, and barrel, because most of them still did not. But it was there. The information was there. Even the world saw that that man was the Son of God. And that was noised abroad. <clears throat> and we know from other verses that that message went throughout the whole world. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 2, 6. <clears throat> Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Who's perfect? Oh, okay. <laughs> Yet not the wisdom of this world. Ah, different kind of wisdom. Nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Yeah, the princes of this world, they're, they're just going to have their time. They'll get their 15 minutes as the world acknowledges, and that'll be that. But we speak of the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, of which I am not worthy, but there it is, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So my comment here is, could they have known it? Yeah. They could have known it, but they didn't. They didn't know it. <clears throat> but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. This, this, I've always loved this verse, but I'm not sure I've always understood it completely. Is this future glories? That's kind of what I've generally thought. Well, that fits, doesn't it? We love the concept. But notice the context here is speaking wisdom of the faithful that princes don't understand. So there's a current aspect to this as well. We understand the love of God. He created us because he loves us, because he wants family. The princes of this world make up memes about God and how cruel he is and everything else. They don't understand his plan. It's a mystery to them. They could have known it, but they don't want to know it. Verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Yes, that can be direct revelation or it can be by the word that he's left. Or it can be orally handed down, as that happened, didn't it? For the Spirit searches all things. You need to search. Yea, the deep things of God. Yeah, search for God. And that is revealed to us now. We have considered the evidence and understand about God and his obvious love for us and the offer and the promises he made of life a life that will be glorious, that we don't know all about it. <clears throat> first Corinthians 4, first verse. First Corinthians 4, 1. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ 
and stewards of the mysteries of God. How can one be a steward of something if he doesn't know what it is? Yeah, I, th I think that's self-evident, isn't it? We do know what it is. Ephesians 3, verse 9. Another verse that is easily misinterpreted, so we'll read a, at least two versions of it. Of course, King James 1, Ephesians 3, 9. In fact, I want to look. Yeah. Which says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The mystery is a fellowship? Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things. We could stop right there. Notice how that's worded? God who created all things. And then the King James goes on to say, by Jesus Christ. Now that word by has a wide range of possibilities. It can mean because of, it can mean on account of, or it can mean for. Um, but it, notice it says, God who created all things. Now I want to read the same verse from a newer version, the ASV, and put a thought in there. And from the ASV it says, and to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery which for the ages hath been hidden God, who created all things, period. So is the by Jesus Christ an addition there? I, I, I think we can understand it either way, can't we? God created. There's a dispensation dealing with the ages. And that is sometimes a mystery. Okay, am I going to have time? I don't know. We'll skip one here. Ephesians six eighteen. Ephesians six eighteen, which Ephesians six eighteen, which says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We, we care for one another. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Whoa, make known. Yeah, it's understandable. Yeah, it's understandable, isn't it? Colossians 1. 25, Colossians 1, 25. <clears throat> Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, whoa, the dispensation of God, even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, it wasn't fully understood, was it? But yet there was quite a bit of understanding. We know that virtually all the prophets and the men of old who were faithful understood the resurrection and the coming kingdom at some level. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Oh, that's something different, isn't it? For a long time, a Gentile had to become a Jew. No longer. Among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, Jesus Christ, of course, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. It's not mysterious that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. <laughs> I want to read this. 2 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 3. You'll forgive me if I go too long, I hope. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. <clears throat> Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, 
did the church change and fall away? Anybody who studies history knows there was tremendous changes. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. Wait a minute, there is no temple now. Oh, there is kind of. It's our body, isn't it? Hmm. He sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. These, these are some remarkable claims, aren't they? Obviously, he's the man of sin. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. What verse do you have here on the restraining? Yeah, the King James is not very clear on this. Withholding and letting are used incorrectly here. So read the one on the screen instead of listening to me. <laughs> uh, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, that's not meaning the current word of let, is it? Uh, will let until he be taken out of the way. There's going to be a time when this man of sin is going to be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. So there's kind of a mystery there, isn't it? Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So when is that happening? The brightness of his coming. Whatever this man of sin is, it's going to continue until the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, wow, with all powers and signs and lying wonders, uh, capable of miracles, so be careful. That doesn't prove where the power is from, does it? And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Okay, we're looking to make sure we're clear on the mysteries by loving the truth. It does matter. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. If you want to believe a lie, you know what? God gave you freedom of choice. He lets you. Look at the scientific world. Follow the science. You know, I'm not meaning to be political here, but the truth is you follow the money, right? That's why some scientists are popular and others are not. They follow the money. So you can believe a lie if you want. God will allow that. He doesn't want that. He wants every man to seek the truth and to be saved. But freedom of choice is what we have. Verse 12, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Ah, there's, there's the reason, isn't it? We think that other stuff other than God is going to make us happy. We kind of become God ourselves, sort of. Kind of been a problem all along, hasn't it? <clears throat> okay. Second Corinthians four three. A real simple, short little verse. We could read more, but we're just gonna read verse three. Second Corinthians four three. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Hopefully we've explained the why of that. It's hid if you don't want to find it, but it isn't actually hidden. 2 Peter 3, and starting at verse 3. Got to read this one. 2 Peter 3, 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. What are the last days? Well, any time after Jesus and the apostles, isn't it? Scoffers walking after their own lusts, yep, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. 
But are they ignorant? No. Every country has a oral or written history of the flood. Every nation, every tribe. It's not hidden at all. I mean, we all drive by various landmarks that, I'm sorry, they, they attribute to local floods or a, an ice age, but it's obviously the results of erosion of water. Huge, at the top of mountains. These things aren't hidden. But they're willingly ignorant of that the word of God, the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now they just want to live in today's pleasure. <clears throat> now in Hebrews 10, we're not going to go there, we know that the law, the law of Hebrew law, the, Israel, the law of Moses, had a shadow of good things to come. The reason I bring this up is because there are mysteries that we don't understand. I'm not, don't misquote me that we understand all mysteries because we don't. We don't understand a lot of science, and even the scientists don't. We don't understand the future that God has given us perfectly well. It's kind of a shadow to us, but we know some things about it. And as long as we don't resist God and make up our own story about that that we cannot prove with God's word, okay, you know, so be it. But there are a bunch of mysteries that are explained, aren't there? The mystery of the dispensation, Jesus preaching, his death, burial, and resurrection, etc. <clears throat> Let's finish with 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 51. Please read this whole chapter over and over and over and over. I had to. When I was new in the faith especially, it was very difficult for me. But starting at verse 51 on, it's not difficult at all. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means dead, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So let's change our mind so we can fit into that. <laughs> For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. Yeah, Jesus is law, the law of God. But thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is victory available through Jesus. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We work, and God notices, and it's not vanity, it's not empty. There is a reward. The temptation that Satan offers on the other side of that coin appears to be right now. But what we have is far greater than that, and we need to make sure we share that with everybody that love, the love of God. Thank you. Let's have a song. Let's conclude this morning's services with song number 231. Open my eyes that I may see, number 231.
God in heaven, our loving Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have created us, that you have given us this life, that you've given us this opportunity to actually be with you, to be a part of your family, to live in perfect knowledge and in perfect love. Lord, we do pray for those searching for your truth, wherever they might be, those who are in need, help us, Lord, to be a helper in any way that we can. Help us to think of you and your love and not our own pride and our own desires, but to think on things above. Lord, thank you, God, for all things. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. <coughs>